Dr. Gabor Mate is, in my view, one of the leading and most interesting experts in the world on questions of mental health, depression, addiction, and how the psychiatric and psychological fields are treating the explosion in these pathologies in the West. He was born in Hungary in 1944, obviously while World War II was raging, and much of his childhood was shaped by experiences of being part of a Jewish family in Europe and the traumas of escaping the Holocaust. He and his family ended up in Canada, in Vancouver, where he became a medical doctor and spent years treating drug addicts, mental health pathologies, and ended up being known for a wide range of then pretty heterodox, even heretical views, which have gained more and more acceptance, including on the need to treat the root causes of depression and addiction, including psychological, emotional, connective, and spiritual ones, rather than just seeing them as chemical imbalances to be corrected with medications. In some narrow circles, including ours, he is sometimes known as the father of Aaron Maté, the outstanding independent journalist who is my friend and a friend of the show. But in reality, in most normal places, he's become one of the world's most influential mental health and addiction experts in the world. And albeit, as is true for most original thinkers, one still controversial in many sectors. He has a new book out entitled The Myth of uh, Normal Tra Trauma, Illness, and Healing in a Toxic Culture. We're excited to talk to him about that and many of the re related issues on which he's long been working. Dr. Mate, uh, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today. We are really thrilled to have you here. Good evening. Glenn, it's really nice to meet you in person. You have a lot of admirers in our family, um, <laughs> and I'm one of them. And uh, so is my son, Daniel, with whom I wrote this book you just mentioned. Absolutely, yeah. So I'm an admirer of the people in your family who work on a lot of different things. Um, I have so many questions for you, but before I get into those specific ones, let's just start with the book. Um, this is not the first book that you've written. And so um, you become well known in a lot of the fields that I talked about there. People see it on the screen. It's called The Myth of Normal Trauma, Illness, and Healing in a Toxic Culture. You've been talking about a lot of things over the years. So what is it that you felt you had new to discuss in this book? Well, basically, in my previous books, I covered uh, issues of mental health or physical health and how they relate to people's life experience. But in this book, we actually look at it on a whole broad cultural level so that the Western medicine in which I was trained separates the mind from the body and the individual from the environment. But scientifically speaking, not to mention from the point of view of traditional wisdom, mind and body are not separable, and the individual manifests uh, something about the culture in which they live. So what we consider normal in this society is very often very toxic, very unhealthy. And to give you a very quick physical example, um, the more experiences of black uh, of racism a black woman experiences, the greater her risk for asthma. So the inflammation and narrowing of her air tubes is not simply a biological pathology in an isolated organ in the discrete individual. It manifests a social malaise. And the pathways have been beautifully worked out by modern science. Unfortunately, this recognition of the unity uh, of, of the individual in the environment is just not recognized in mainstream medical circles. I want to give you a couple of statistics over many years just to kind of indicate for our viewers how long this increase in the use of antidepressant medication by your field has been going on. So we found a Reuters article from 2009, so that's almost 15 years ago, the entire the title yeah. of which was Antidepressant Use Doubles in the United States, Study Finds. And it said the use of antidepressant drugs in the United States doubled between 1996 and 2005, probably because of a mix of yeah. factors. Researchers reported on Monday about 6% of people were prescribed an antidepressant in 1996, 13 million people. This rose to more than 10 million, more, this rose to by 10% or 27 million people by 2005, the researchers found. And then more updated data from the CDC says the same thing. It just keeps increasing, 2015 to 2018. 13.2% of adults age 18 and over used antidepressant medication in the last 30 days. It's higher among women, 17.7%, and it increased with age yeah. overall in both sexes. It is every demographic field, every, demo, every age, not just in the last few years, but for a couple of decades and now, it's just an explosion of these medications. What is going on with that? Well, in January, in 19... So in 2020, it was also reported that uh, 
that diagnosis of uh, anxiety went up 36% in one year in the United States. And uh, in 2017, um, 40 million adults now suffer from anxiety disorder. And these medications, the so-called antidepressants, they're also prescribed for anxiety. So the number of people that are, are, are being prescribed medication, not to mention all the kids, the millions who are being diagnosed with, uh, with ADHD and being medicated with stimulants, um, the statistics for all mental health disorders are going up and up and up. The number of Americans overdosing last year, you may be aware, more Americans died, t almost twice as many Americans died in one year of drug overdoses than died in the Vietnam, Iraq, and Afghan wars put together. And these numbers keep rising. So there's something happening to the mental health of the population. And the response of the medical profession is to see it as a biological problem purely and to try and change the biology of the brain. Now, having said that, the antidepressants, or you might also call them anti-anxiety medications because they also work for anxiety, they can help some people to confess. I've, t I've taken them myself with benefit, but they don't work as well as they're meant to do, meant to work, number one, for a lot of people. Number two, their rationale for their use is scientifically um, untenable, uh, unproven. And thirdly, the biggest problem is that even if they work, which sometimes they do, they're only dealing with the symptom, not with the underlying problem. And in our profession, my profession, is just not educated to deal with underlying um, dynamics that lead to what we call mental illness. We just deal with the manifestation. So we're actually missing the boat when it comes to treating people. And uh, some of that is used to the narrowness, is due to the narrowness of the medical ideology. Some of it is due to the very clever manipulation of research by the drug companies. And in general, in the Western capitalist ideology, that people are individuals and their problems are individuals. And let's not look at the broader social and traumatic issues that really cause uh, mental illness. So I know there's a lot going on here, and I want to talk about some of the other issues, but we just did a segment on the profit motive of war. Obviously during COVID, there was a lot of discussion about some of the profit motives driving a lot of early and rapid approval of certain medications that didn't end up working nearly as well as they said, things that didn't really, yeah. people didn't have a good grasp on. So in terms of profit motive, when it comes to dispensing these medications, there's usually two components of it. One is it's a lot easier from a financial perspective to go to a doctor and instead of delving into your childhood traumas and all your difficulties, they just write a prescription and send you on your way and you go back two months later and they check on your physical symptoms. But also there's obviously a big profit motive in the pharmaceutical companies selling these medications in massive numbers. Is it too cynical to think that those are, even though there's other factors, and I wanna talk about them, that those are significant factors in the explosion of the prescription of these medications? Well, look, when um, I was a family physician, I bought into, I drank the Kool-Aid, you know, for a while. Um, somebody would come in with what I perceived as symptoms of depression, and I would blithely and very sincerely explain that what you've got is the lack of serotonin in your brain. Let's give you a medication that increases serotonin levels. Serotonin is an important neurotransmitter, chemical messenger in the brain, and this will fix your problem. And um, sometimes it did. But what I was saying was scientific hogwash. There's absolutely zero evidence that low serotonin levels cause depression. And the ideology that it does was very cynically promoted by the pharmaceutical companies, despite any lack of evidence. And there was a very interesting guy called Robert Whitaker, who used to be head of medical publications at um, Harvard University. And he wrote a book called Anatomy of an Epidemic. And he also uh, wrote for the Boston Globe, I think. And, and he was a sincere believer in this hypothesis that lack of serotonin causes depression until he started looking for the research. And he couldn't find any. And at first he couldn't believe his eyes. And then he went to the experts and they said, oh yeah, there's no such evidence, it's just a metaphor. And so uh, that metaphor really took hold in the medical profession. And what research do medical uh, professionals see was published in the medical journals. Who funds the research? The pharmaceutical companies who have a clear interest that 
their product be um, sold and, and propagated. And so to say that there's nothing cynical about it, it's just how it works. And uh, it wouldn't be the only example. One of the things I think is so interesting is if even just as kind of a layperson, you go and read about the various most popular SSRIs and antidepressants, which I've done before yeah. when friends have gotten suggestions from doctors that they should take them or I've just been interested in it. If you just read the basic literature, I don't mean the advanced medical literature, you need a degree in order to understand, but just the basic literature, it will say medical professionals have seen that it works because patients say it works, but people, they don't really have a good, clear idea scientifically about why it does. Kind of what you were just saying, that th there's really no proven explanation about why these uptake, reuptake inhibitors will actually cure depression. Is it also the case that the question of risks, midterm, long-term risks, are also very unknown? Minimize? Well, um, it's for sure that antidepressants, like, like any time you take a medication of any kind, to be fair, it's a bit of an experiment because every, every person is physiologically discreet and different. And so when I prescribe medication, I don't know what effects it's going to have. It could have beneficial effects, or it could have side effects, or it could have both. And um, the side effects tend to be minimized, and the benefits tend to be maximized uh, in, the, uh, in the literature that uh, the pharmaceutical companies send out. And they, they sometimes select the research that they will publish and then the research that they will not publish. You know. So now having said that, I just want to be clear about it. Sometimes they do work. I've taken them, and believe me, they've helped me. But, again, the real problem is, first of all, they work not as frequently as we think they do. Secondly, they do cause side effects more frequently than we like to talk about. And number three, whether they work or not, they don't address the underlying dynamic and underlying problem. So, 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 um, so, so let, me, let, me, let me ask you about that, though, because... As I'm sure you know, this is a controversial topic because people have written against these medications in the way that you've done and others have done, and there are people who swear by them. You know, there are people who say, these saved my life, these changed my life, they have not, they didn't just have a temporary effect, they have made my life livable. Let's assume just for the moment that one of these medications actually does do that, or some new medication coming down the pike will do that. Namely, it will have these very, visible effects that patients testify to, the life changes are visible. And let's say they're more common than the current ones. Instead of working 30% of the cases, they work in 70% of the cases. And let's say they work more or less permanently. Would you still say that it's still an adequate, an inadequate solution if it doesn't treat the underlying problem, or is the only thing that matters that people have these terrible debilitating symptoms and as long as the medication is helping them, let's applaud it even if it doesn't help the underlying symptoms. Why does it matter so much to help the underlying symptoms? Well, first of all, just dealing with the facts doesn't deal with causes. And uh, as long as we're focusing only on the downstream uh, alleviation of symptoms. We're not going to look at the broad social causes that actually are driving this epidemic of suicides, ADHD, addictions, depression, anxiety, and every other mental health disorder. So we are, it allows us to ignore what's really necessary to pay attention to, which is the broad social cultural factors, which amongst other things we touch upon in our book. So that's the one problem. The other problem is nothing works permanently unless you keep taking it. So that the uh, antidepressants, they don't cure, they don't change the brain in the sense that once you stop them, now your brain is fixed. No, it isn't. As a matter of fact, it's sometimes very difficult to get off these medications. There's significant withdrawal symptoms. So people tend to stay on them for much longer than they need to, just because coming off them can be so painful and so um, distressing. And number three, um, just the medications themselves, even when they do work, they don't give the person the capacity to free themselves from all the um, psychological dynamics and, 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 and emotional hurts 
that are, had, drive that depression in the first place. I mean, just look at the word depression itself. Glenn, let me ask you, what does it mean to depress something? It means to push it down. What gets pushed on in depression is your emotions. And why do people push down their emotions? Because when they were children, they had to push down their emotions in order to... So they become disconnected from themselells. So now, the I, end of the essence in, go ahead, sorry. so what I'm saying is we're not dealing with the underlying issue. So I, I want to spend the bulk of my time that I have left on those underlying issues that is the focus of your book, um, which I read a good part of, and I'm very interested in that. Just I have one more question though before I get to that, which is um, yeah. I want to just use an analogy. It may seem off base, but I think the relevance will be evident in a second, which is, There's a big debate now about trans people, and there are these st statistics showing that there's this huge increase in the number of people who are identifying as being trans. And a lot of people say, oh, that's because there's a social pathology to it. There's a contagion that the more you legitimize it, the more people seek out that self-identity to distinguish themselves, to give them social clout. And usually the answer to that yeah. that advocates of trans people will offer is no, it's very similar to left-handedness. For a long time, people were left-handedness was discouraged, it was punished in private schools. People who used their left hand would be you know slapped and told to use the right hand. And so the percentage of people who identified as left-handed, quite unsurprisingly, was very low. Soon as the stigma was lifted and people realized it's not any better or any worse, the numbers of people who are left-handed in the population shut up simply because the stigma is gone and now people come out and say, I'm left-handed, whereas before they didn't. Is it possible that the significant increase in people identifying as being depressed or being diagnosed as depressed has to do with the elimination of or reduction of the stigma around seeking out therapy, talking about your mental health problems? Do you think that's at least part of it? Well, theoretically that's possible, but when you look at the overwhelming numbers, uh, people don't kill themselves because the stigma on suicide has been destroyed. You know, people kill themselves because they're desperate. And so I think in, in, in the numbers of people committing suicide, the young people is going up relentlessly. Um, children don't um, uh, scatter their minds and, and to quote the title of one of my earliest books on ADHD, scatter. People, children don't scatter their minds because it's legitimate socially to tune out. They tune out because they're under stress and the tuning out becomes their coping mechanism so they don't suffer so much from the stress. And same with depression. People don't depress their emotions because all of a sudden it's uh, permissible to talk about depression. People push down their emotions because their early environments forbid them to experience themselves authentically. So, uh, you know, I don't think that the removal of the stigma is actually responsible um, for the number of people now um, acknowledging anxiety and depression in our lives. I think that has to do with the stress of modern society. So let's talk about that then. That's what I want to focus on. So just to give people a sense of what you were talking about, here's just the CDC data. Um, it's not for that long of a period of time, it's for the last decade basically. And you can just see this is the number of deaths due to suicide in the United States from the CDC. And you can just see from 2012 to 2022, the number pretty much goes up in a straight line. Um, you know, the trend is just, I mean, it had a little bit drop one year, but that's like kind of an, an, uh, an aberration. And you just see it going up this steep hill. What is, or what are the primary social, emotional, Uh, uh, psychological, spiritual causes of the rise in depression, the rise in addiction, the rise in anxiety, the rise in suicide as you see it? Well, um, addiction, um, properly understood, is not a disease uh, or, ge or genetic, really. What it is, nor is it a free choice that somebody makes. Addiction is a desperate attempt to escape human suffering. And... Uh, When you ask people, what do you get from your addiction, whether it's pornography or drugs or gambling or, you know, nicotine, caffeine, heroin, what does it give you? They all get something like uh, stress relief, numbing from emotional pain, separation from distress, a sense of control, sense of agency, sense of belonging. All of these things are essential human attributes. And the addicted person just wants to feel like a normal human being. And so my mantra is don't ask why the addiction, ask why the pain. And if you want to understand why people are in emotional pain that they have to escape from, 
you have to look at their lives. And if you look at their lives, whether you do it anecdotally or in large scale studies statistically, it's trauma, it's adversity, it's stress, it's emotional pain. Now, if you look at depression, again, the word itself means to push something down. What gets pushed down in are people's emotions, their legitimate anger. Um, and uh, for example, and this happens when children are abused or they just not seen, received, understood, attuned with, valued for who they are. They, they have to pretend to be somebody else. They have to suppress their emotions in order to be acceptable by their environment. And in a society where the parenting environment itself, due to no fault of parents, but because of the stresses of society, is becoming more and more volatile, more and more stressed. Families are more and more under um, conditions of isolation and, and um, pressure. More, less, fewer and fewer parents are able to be there for the kids the way they need to be, which means kids have to be pushing down their feelings, which means you're going to see more depression. And if you look at the broad social causes, it's everything that you've often talked about on your program, the rise in inequality, you can trace inequality and the rise in mental health problems in a society. You can trace globalization, increasing isolation, and the rise in ADHD from Germany to Israel to China, the United States. Uh, you can trace globalization, inequality, and the rise in, rise in obesity and diabetes. Um, and if you look at the social factors that stress people, they are the factors that are generated um, voluminously in an individualistic, aggressive, of, uh, capitalistic uh, society, which are um, loss of control, um, uh, fear, conflict, uncertainty, and lack of information. And when you put millions of people under such conditions, you're going to see a rise in all manner of pathologies. I want to share a little anecdote with you because sometimes I use this as insight into some of the things I think about this. I'm interested in, in what you think about it because when we're talking about, I realize obviously as a doctor who's treated individuals, understanding the individual is crucial, right? So that's a little bit anathema to talking about these broad societal trends and yet at the same time, if you're looking at these charts and you see this huge increase, there must be things in the society that everybody has in common or that's at least a factor, a frequent factor in a lot of these cases. I lived in New York for 15 years uh, and I was a lawyer. I was working in Manhattan. It was an extremely high pressed, high social, high, high stress lifestyle. I remember I lived in the same building in a condominium for eight years. I never once spoke to any of my neighbors, mm -hmm. even though we would often leave the apartment at the same time to go to work. You would just look straight ahead. You, if anyone exchanged any sorts of small talk, you would like call the police. You would think the person was weird. It was just very much, and, and I remember as well, I would, you know, if I was in an ATM line and somebody entered the wrong, yeah. the wrong password and had to start over, I'd want to murder them because they wasted seven seconds of my time that I now can't use to maximize my economic utility. And when I moved to Brazil, yeah. everything was different. You get into a line, of people in a pharmacy or in a grocery store and someone gets to the front of the line and even though there are six people behind them, they just start chatting about their families and about their kids. And at first, when I started living there, I was going to have an aneurysm. I wanted to kill them. How could someone be so selfish? And then I started kind of realizing, wait a minute, this is like human connection. This is communicating with other human beings about your life and about your family the way we've always lived in small villages where we've known people. And we didn't live in these big concrete jungles where we were expected to just stare straight ahead and never talk to anybody. And I'm wondering whether you think that some of these changes and just how industrialized society has become, people don't marry as early, they don't start families, um, they're expected to focus on careers, which are often very soul draining, they don't have religion, that they're just getting more and more isolated without any kind of human or spiritual connection. Do you think, societally speaking, those are big factors? Well, first of all, I do think so, but never mind what I think. That's just what the science and the research actually shows. So that loneliness and isolation has become a modern epidemic. And the number of people who are lonely goes up, doubles like every 10 years, it seems, according to the statistics. And loneliness, statistically, is a significant factor for um, 
illness, I'm talking about physical illness as well, as uh, smoking 15 cigarettes a day. And those are just statistics. Now, as you suggest, by the way, let me tell you an anecdote, okay? So I was visiting Costa Rica uh, some years ago, and uh, everybody just smiles at you and says, hello, hola, senor. I'm sure you've seen this. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I'm, I'm in this shop, little shop, buying a cold drink. And this woman, a stranger, says to me, hola, senor. And I, I don't respond. She comes up, puts her face in my face and said, hola, senor. You know, wake up. I'm talking to you, you know. And I said, hola, senora, you know. And so that's how it works. And as you suggested, this is not how we evolved. For millions of years, our, hum our hominin ancestors, and for hundreds of thousands of years, our own species lived in small band hunter-gatherer groups until, historically speaking, the blink of an eye ago. If our species has been around for one hour, I mean, if you can, that 200,000 years that our species has been on Earth can be condensed to an hour, then until five minutes ago, we lived in small band communities where everybody knew each other else. And that's our evolutionary nature, and that's what we expect, and that's what our nervous system expects. So to live in a culture that initially isolates and turns people against each other and makes them suspicious of each other and stresses them and destroys families and stresses communities, is this is why we call the, 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 the subtitle of the book um, Trauma, Illness, and Hanging in a Toxic Culture. It's a toxic culture precisely because it denies the essential human needs that we as a species have evolved over eons. And this is totally unnatural. It's considered the norm, but it's so unnatural as to make us sick. And that's what's happening. And that needs to be recognized on the political level, on the social level, on the legal level, on the educational level, and for God's sakes, on the medical level. And it is not, despite all the science and despite all the wisdom that points us in the right direction. So a couple more questions. Uh, at the very start of the COVID pandemic, when, you know, I think most people didn't really know what we were dealing with. There was a lot of horror stories coming out of not just China, but Iran and Italy and Spain. Uh, I remember I interviewed uh, two mental health experts, one Andrew Solomon, who wrote a very well-celebrated book on yeah. depression in 2002, and the other Johan Hari, who has written about addiction and depression. Yeah. And I remember being, I don't think I've ever been so alarmed before by interviews I've done because both of them were saying essentially, Look, the mental health pathologies in the West, the warning signs are already blink blinking as red as they can possibly be blinking. If we are now about to enter into a period of time where forced isolation and lockdowns are needed, and at the time we were still talking about things like flattening the curve, it seemed kind of temporary. I don't think anyone thought it was going to be a year, two years, where people are going to just be very kind of separated from their lives which ended up happening, I remember being really scared by them um, and always thinking, even though of course COVID policy is very controversial and without taking a specific position, I always felt like the cost from all those, the mental health cost, were never really fully appreciated in part because whenever you have an immediate danger of something you think is gonna kill you, these longer term costs seem more like luxuries that you can kind of put to the side. Do you think that they were right to be as alarmist as they did, and how would you characterize the way in which the COVID isolation and lockdowns ended up exacerbating these problems? Yeah, well, this, first of all, there's no doubt that, that the COVID isolation increased uh, family violence, uh, child abuse, uh, uh, addictive behaviors, and so on. So, I mean, it's to, to, retrospectively, that's just how it happened. So, insofar as they were worried about that, they were quite right to worry about it. Um, in the beginning, I was kind of a skeptic, and I said, well, only later on when we look back are we going to know um, what was right and what wasn't right, what was done properly, what was overdone or not done. Um, then for a while, I kind of jumped on the social isolation bandwagon, thinking along with my infectious diseases colleagues, I'm not infectious diseases, but my medical colleagues in infectious diseases, that, okay, we have to do everything we can to you know, stop the spread of this virus. In retrospect, I go back to my original skeptical position 
and uh, we paid a huge price. Uh, we paid a huge price by the policies that we really thought were necessary at the time, but we did not consider the broad social costs. And, um, you know, increasingly the debate is going to attract more research. Um, when you look at countries like uh, Sweden that didn't have such a strict enforcement and they had a more open policy, they didn't suffer more than others. Um, so I think that's a conversation that we need to have, uh, not just to do a retrospective on the past, but also to guide us in the future. But certainly the social psychological impacts of what we were doing were not did not form a, a properly um, accredited part of the conversation. It should have, and uh, to the extent that Andrew Solomon and Johan Hari, who's Johan is actually a friend, um, they raised that alarm. They were quite right to do so. Uh, last question, um, and it's about a controversial topic, but one that you have a lot of experience working on directly with patients, which is the best approach to drug addiction, I think there was a, a, a kind of trend uh, in the United States and the West to stop thinking about drug addiction and drug use as a crime and treat it more as a health problem, to be opposed to the imprisonment of people as cities are starting to be more filled with people who are clearly terrible addicts and there's a perception that they're creating a dangerous environment or causing crime. I think there's unfortunately a reversal on that where people are now more turning to punitive uh, measures to put people into prison because of it. Just two quick questions. One, on an ethical issue, if you begin with the premise as you did that drug addiction happens because of a spiritual deprivation or disease, does it make any sense to put those people into prison? And then secondly, what does the data show about what happens if you treat drug addicts as criminals and stick them into incarceration? Well, I mean, the historical evidence is irrefutable. Um, the so-called war on drugs, which has been waged with ferocity now internationally and led and chair-led and sometimes imposed by the United States, is leading to more and more people being addicted and more and more people dying of addiction. I mean, when Nancy Reagan had her totally inconceived and you know, illiterate program, I should say, just say no. Um, how successful was that? How successful was is that now we have many more people dying of overdoses uh, than they did in those days. So, I mean, those punitive and prohibitive and discouraging approaches um, simply don't work. Well, they do work. They work to keep the prison industrial complex going. They keep uh, police forces well armed and uh, well endowed. They keep uh, the justice system or the so-called justice system it's called it's not called in my view as i pointed out in this book it's not called the criminal justice system for no reason it is a criminal justice system because it punishes people for being hurt and turning to painkillers to soothe their pains so you know it's, it's utter nonsense now i was the physician in north america's first supervised injection site here in vancouver where people brought in their illegal drugs, but they weren't arrested, they could be given clean needles so that they don't affect, infect each other with HIV, hepatitis C, sterile water, a tourniquet, and if they overdose, they'd be resuscitated. And many lives were saved. And so that's called harm reduction. And some people say harm reduction coddles the drug addict. No, it doesn't. But what, I, what I would ask opponents of harm reduction is to tell me what's better, that people should inject with dirt and needles using puddle water from the back alleys? Or should they use sterile water? And given human contact, which would encourage them to seek help and to move on to other treatment approaches. The problem is, is that the harm reduction approach, which is now being adopted, thank God, in more and more American cities, still exists in a context of hostility and severe judgment or probium ostracization of drug addicts, which has not only its medical aspects, but also its um, social and racial aspects, as we know. And furthermore, the average physician, I mean, this is 
shocking to say that despite all the evidence linking drug use specifically with addictions in general, whether again from shopping to pornography to eating to gambling, whatever it is, linking to trauma, despite all the scientific evidence statistically, and despite all the scientific evidence showing how the physiology of the brain is actually programmed by early childhood experience. So painful childhood experiences lead to different brains that are more prone to addiction, despite the scientific evidence that's not even vaguely controversial. The average physician to this day does not hear a single lecture on childhood trauma. So the gap between the science and the evidence on the one hand and practice is huge. And this is true, not uniformly, but frequently enough, even in the addiction treatment uh, sector. Well, Dr. Mate, um, as I said at the beginning, one of the, there's a lot of things I find so interesting about your work. One of them, from a media perspective, is that you've really been able to find a receptive audience with programs and people across the political spectrum, left, right, and everything in between, which is very rare these days. And I think the reason for that is because you're able to speak with a lot of compassion about the individual from your work and just your approach, but also you offer the societal critique about a lot of the cultural and spiritual deprivations of our society that are at a, the root of a lot of these problems that I think to appeal to a lot of people as well. And I look at this book, The Myth of Normal, Trauma, Illness, and Healing in a Toxic Culture as kind of the culmination of that part of your work. Uh, it's by you and Daniel Mate, and I really hope people who found this conversation interesting, and I know I'm among them, will pick up this book because it expands on a lot of these themes. Thank you so much for all your great work and for taking the time to talk to me about it tonight. I really appreciate it. Well, thanks for your work, and certainly thank you for having me and giving me this platform to speak my, uh, my truth. Thank Absolutely. You. Hope to talk to you again. Have a great evening. Thanks for watching this clip from System Update, our live show that airs every Monday through Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern, exclusively on Rumble. You can catch the full nightly shows live or view the backlog of episodes for free on our Rumble page. You can also find full episodes the morning after they air across all major podcasting platforms, including Spotify and Apple. All the information you need is linked below. We hope to see you there.